having me. Uh, this talk will be, well, who wants an economics lecture after that talk, right? So that's, <laughs> that's gonna happen. Uh, you sort of have no choice now if you want to believe. You sort of slipped out in between, now you're kind of stuck. <laughs> that's all right. Um, so I serve as the head economist and the head of the data science division at Hallway, an Expedia company. Uh, located, we have one office about one mile west of here, and I work about eight miles north of here in the domain. And uh, here to talk today about a few case studies on how vacation rentals interact with the hotel industry. And you know, working for a company like Expedia, you know, Expedia is making a bet on both, and so is Booking.com, right? And so uh, Expedia and both Booking want to be all up lodging and accommodation providers. Expedia also has a big travel business, the Priceline Group that owns Booking. <coughs> has uh, a, a substantially smaller, but it's a sizable uh, uh, air travel business as well. And so Expedia Inc. is quite interested in how these two markets interact. Uh, for one, they might be interested in how they can intermingle results in a sort page of hotels, vacation rental departments, and so forth. They're also interested in how to run the brands, how to integrate into the company, and one of the sort of sources of consternation when you acquire a company, Homeway was acquired by Expedia two years ago, is what's gonna happen? And how many roles are gonna be there? How's it gonna be integrated? And, I was, I was brought on board after that, so I don't, I don't really know. They don't tell me the answers to those things. We just try to do our jobs. But a few, uh, a few case studies here, and like I said, this will be kind of a lot more dry than what you just saw. I think I have like 100 times less slides, uh, infinity times less F words in the slides. <laughs> and so go ahead and stop. Like I said, when you, you, know, you bring a PhD economist to talk, you really you get what you deserve. So <laughs> you can thank the organizers. Um, and also I realized when I got here, they're like, oh, by the way, we read your slides, and things are gonna be an unpopular message. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for telling me that five minutes before I go on. <laughs> That's my bad, I sent the slides late last night, so it's on me too. Um, so hey, if it's an unpopular message, what I'm gonna do is slip the fuck out of here um, <laughs> real fast, and, uh, and so that you won't ever see me again. So you'll be like, oh yeah, I met this jerk, <laughs> he slipped out of here. Um, so, no, I'm just kidding, I'll, I'll kind of stick around. Um, okay, so uh, when you think about vacation rentals, I think there's, for me, I think of four key factors to keep in mind, and we're gonna do case studies that cover two of these, so certainly not comprehensive. And the interaction between a vacation rental, whether it be a condo, uh, an apartment, or a cabin, sort of a traditional more cabin vacation rental experience, will depend on the market, and so I think any universal statement about these, uh, these two markets would be sort of patently false on its face because it will depend on what the market conditions. And in that spirit, I'll show you two really in-depth case studies, and I'd like to show you sort of the methodology that I believe in, we believe in, rather than, hey, this is the end-all, be-all message of what's going on. Um, and also, I probably should say, I don't know if it's been recorded, like, anything I say represents my views and not Expedia Inc's like Marco Castrano, our CEO, it's not my brain, so I don't know. I didn't clear any like impromptu jokes either, so we'll see. <laughs> um, so urban, um, for vacation rentals or apartments, and especially in North America, urban markets, traditional urban markets, uh, such as Austin, Texas, or New York City and San Francisco, um, there's either no regulations, there's new regulations, there's murky regulations, and there's a huge amount of non-compliance issues. Um, that is to say, there might be someone renting an apartment and they are breaking their lease or they're violating some local law that really hasn't been enforced in years because no one was doing it, or there's no law and so it's actually quite unclear what the compliance should be. Um, in North America, there's vacation destinations. Think of these as vacation towns, so Destin, Florida is one we really care about. Um, and there you have a mature vacation rental industry. So the industry existed long before VRBO, HomeAway, Airbnb, and the industry has been transformed by the ability to distribute, and people have entered the market due to higher profit margins because you drastically lower the cost of distribution and you reach the greater portion of the potential travel segments. But the industry existed and was quite mature, and the regulations around it were quite mature. Um, so that industry is expanding the online sales, but it was not created in urban to a large extent in many cases, the industry was created with the online marketplaces. Um, in North America, the vacation rental industry is much more rent, rented by an owner of the home. Um, this is true even up to and including urban markets or the uh, long-term renter. Um, in Europe, 
there's a much blurrier line between what's considered a vacation rental, an apartment, a condo. So you can, in Europe, you might show up and it's like an apartment complex that's zoned for very short stays, and then there's a receptionist. And you're like, okay, well, I don't know what that is. That seems like a hotel to me. But it's in, in, in technical, legal ways, in many ways it's not, based on how they clean and unions and housekeeping and so forth. And so it's a lot more murky. In North America, I think it will go that direction. It's say different cities will have different regulations. And so in some cities, it might be what you consider legally a hotel. It differs uh, city to city. And certainly, it's true now. I think it will become more true. Um, so those are your sort of four. Like when you hear people talk about this, I would keep these four factors in mind. Now, in North America, Homeway VRBO does most of our business in vacation destinations. And Airbnb does most of their business in urban destinations. And I'll show you a case, two case studies in this talk, one from an urban destination. Um, and one from a vacation destination. You'll see, you'll see that. Uh, I'll show you just raw data on how we're doing for Airbnb and the hotels. Um, I won't talk about Europe as much, but in Europe, Booking.com is quite dominant, as you all know. And Booking is making a, a very concerted effort to have the accommodation site be unified. And so Booking believes implicitly that they can sell hotels, apartments, condos, cabins, in the same user experience and is investing really heavily in that. Expedia is doing that, but has is obviously following more of a branded strategy where VRBO would be your where you get a vacation rental from Expedia Group and Expedia Group you're calling it a hotel, even though in principle you can get either on both. That's what you're doing instead of following a, a, a more um, segmentation and brand strategy. We'll talk about why they might be doing that, if that's a good idea or not, as well. Um, so I'll do two case studies. Uh, and so, like, unfortunately, the jokes are over now. It's just the numbers and stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, and it will be San Diego and uh, Orange Beach, Alabama, a Baldwin County where Gulf Shores and if you uh, right next to, to Florida. So um, San Diego has a massive tourism industry, as you well know. And San Diego County um, classifies overnight visitors as their hotel, motel, or they're staying in a house of some sort, whether it's a short-term rental or a, a friend staying in a house. Um, I don't know what other overnight is. That's staying somewhere. Um, and you can see that uh, hotels in San Diego are substantially larger than all other forms of staying overnight, um, but they're comparable in size. So the household segment is 35 to 45%. Of that, I would, I would tell you about half, a little less than half, would be on a short-term rental market where we know money has changed hands, and half is either informally on the market or it's there's no money changing hands. It's you're staying at a friend's place, you're not paying them, or you're staying with a friend. Um, so in San Diego last July, their peak season, um, you had um, uh, a million uh, hotel stays, hotel visitors, and you had, in the peak season, you can see the household market really peaks up, you had 900,000. But in the off-peak season, the Delta will um, what's the trick here? There we go. Um, this, uh, this graph gives the percentage of people staying in a household, and you can see that, that dynamic we'll see of the, in the compression periods, the household market is, is expanding. And when we look at hotel occupancy rates, the answer will be very clear. The hotels are literally sold out. And one of the reasons in the sort of dynamic of competition between these two units is the elasticity of supply in these areas. That is to say, the household market can kind of expand and contract a little more readily than the hotel market, right? Um, actually, substantially more readily. Um, and so you will see a higher, in every market we look at, we, we see a higher degree of seasonality. We'll see that in one degree as well. Um, when we talk to San Diego County about how they're gonna regulate short-term rentals, you know, they're well aware of the scope of their service industry, but the numbers are really staggering, I think. So 38 million people visited San Diego, and 290 million uh, direct uh, trains and occupants taxes collected, and an estimated total 743 million when you do the math on local expenditures, sales tax, and everything like that. And so San Diego, in terms of their tax basis, is incredibly reliant. And you can build like two football stadiums a year with this money. Now, as you know, they refuse to build one. The Chargers now playing like a soccer stadium in LA. But um, it is a, a massive part of the industry. So the legislators there are concerned with keeping the hotel industry safe, secure, and thriving, 
and sensible regulations around short-term rentals that allow the residents to have a safe, secure existence, but also doesn't stand on the neck of a growing industry. And so we'll sort of talk about what that means. So here I'll show you a, a map, uh, this is a bit of an eye chart of San Diego County. And what I'll highlight here is that a place like Carlsbad, the top right of the slide, Carlsbad is closer to a traditional vacation destination. And in Carlsbad, short-term rentals are banned except in a designated coastal zone. Okay? Um, Salon Beach, more of a vacation destination. And so what you'll see typically is that even in San Diego County, the areas that were more had an existing vacation rental industry had zoning regulations around it that are 30, 40 years old in many cases. San Diego proper has no real regulations on it. That is to say, no one Attorneys can't really agree on what's legal and what's not. They don't have any specific laws around short-term rentals. They have a patchwork of other laws that you can interpret as applying, which is very confusing. Um, and you can see a place like Coronado has sort of more aggressive bans. So a company like Homeway VRBO, what we're interested in is promoting comp regulations that will make sense for the city and make sense for our industry and looking at the whole market, the hotel market as well, as I said, Expedia Inc. also cares about the health of the hotel market for, in, a, in a major way. Um, and so that's all I'll show you sort of analysis today. But what I'll say in terms of like my background as an economist is that zoning regulations are not controversial in the economic literature. They are absolutely not controversial. That is to say, the idea of like carving out a certain area and saying that's commercial and carving out a certain area and saying that's residential, it's not controversial. There's a few cities, I grew up in Houston, that didn't have them, and they kind of like over time asymptoted to having them effectively because people like to coordinate where shops are versus where homes are. And so it just kind of, it's a coordination mechanism to put similar things in a similar place. And with short-term rentals, again, if you proactively do this, it makes sense, right? You sort of identify the areas where there are zones of high demand, and then those areas can have infrastructure and specialization to support that economic activity. Other areas can have specialization and so forth to support residential activity, and it makes a lot of sense. So I think that zoning in general, we should sort of accept that it's a non-controversial subject. What gets really hard is when you come in and zone after the fact, after industries have grown to be quite mature because then you're taking money out of people's hands, or massive uncertainty, or overreactions. That's where we sort of get very, very nervous. Zoning itself, I think it would be sort of asinine to assert that you want no zoning um, in just general urban economies because we have really good evidence from the 20th century to say that's a bad idea. I mean, I grew up in Houston. If you've been to Houston, you know it's a bit of a mess, right? So that's it, Houston's the evidence. Um, and literally, urban economics folks focus on Houston because it's the biggest city that didn't have zoning laws. Um, so when we think about, that's sort of the lay of land, that's what we'll talk about. And what San Diego cares about is protecting their tax base, making their residents happy with sensible zoning laws, and understanding what's gonna happen. Their tax base depends on the health of the hotel industry, um, as well as the health of the short-term rental industry. Um, San Diego has one point, San Diego County has 1.2 million housing units, um, 26,000, uh, or you know, around 1.8% or whatever that is, is our seasonal homes. That is, they're not occupied by a long-term renter or the owner, okay? This is your supply of potential vacation rentals. Um, you can see that as of a week ago, whenever I pulled this data, uh, <coughs> Airbnb had 20,000 live listings and Homeway had 10,000, there's some overlap there. So effectively, all these seasonal homes are on, the, are on the online marketplaces, which makes sense. San Diego County rents are high, where these are are on the coast. If you have a seasonal home, you're going to put it on, you're going to try to rent it out. Um, you can look at the average daily rates. The average stay, something you'll always see, the average stay length in vacation rentals, when we look at our Expedia data versus our VRBO data, substantially longer, substantially longer. And so you're just looking at these stays between um, homeways as VRBOs as six. Um, we collect, so we buy data on Airbnb's bookings, pretty sensible thing to do. And so what I'm showing you here is Airbnb's bookings and our bookings combined in the San Diego market, plotted over time and the economist that worked for me has done a kind of time series projection. The red line is today. Every black dot is real. Every thing out to the right of the red line is projected. And so you'll see a pretty clear seasonal pattern. The peaks are July. And you're seeing a very strong upward growth um, in room night stay in vacation rentals in San Diego County. What you also just saw is that essentially every 
San Diego County seasonal home is on the market, and occupancy right now in these seasonal homes is 50 or 60 percent. So we have some runway of just increasing occupancy. That is the theoretical limit there with stay lengths and uh, over gap days and so forth. But you know, San Diego is looking at kind of they have a gift coming, which is they have a massive growing part of their tourism segment that is growing both in terms of night stays and ADRs. Um, I'll show you hotels in a second. The good news story is hotels are thriving as well in San Diego, and so San Diego's just tourism market is thriving. And so the message you want to have them is what do you do in that situation? Um, the reason hotels, I think, are thriving in the same time vacation rentals are thriving in San Diego is that the visitor distribution is very, very different. So I'm showing you here of, of bookers in San Diego, real data, home away VRBO, 52% um, of bookers were families, 37% um, were adult groups, so three adults or more, and 11% are what my sort of work we call couples, which is either uh, two people or one people that are both adults. And so when you look at this graph for Expedia data on hotels, it's basically the exact opposite. 90% look like they're one or two people, which you guys know before booking hotels, that's your a very common booking pattern. And so the basic segmentation of the demand base for these markets looks very, very different. And so, I'll show you our inventory in a second, um, but maybe I took that graph away, I don't know. Our inventory is also, uh, over 75% is more than one bedroom, right? So it makes sense, these big groups are staying in, in bigger homes. Um, looking at uh, ADRs in this market, uh, we can see the top line is our overall home weight prices, and the two lines below that are for one bedrooms. Um, and you see that so the overall prices are quite high, um, and you see that compression period because of the larger homes. Um, this is uh, Smith Travel Research data that Expedia Inc. buys uh, on average daily rates for uh, hotels in San Diego, and I think you know SDR claims every one of them is on there, but almost all of them. Um, same style of graph, black dots, real data, uh, everything to the future of the red line is a projection based on this time series. Uh, forecasting model, and you can see here a pretty consistent growth trend in ADRs, an obvious clear seasonal pattern, and one of the things we looked at was what's the peak to trial ratio in ADR, and you can see that it's pretty stable around $60. The July average ADR to the January average ADR differs by about $60, and there has been in that time period just a consistent growth in average daily rates. Um, when we look at uh, occupancy, I'll show you the graph instead. Um, go ahead, uh, this is San Diego occupancy over time, the blue bars um, on the, on the uh, average over the entire year versus the national average. And the, since 2010, there was a minor recession, the hotel industry has been doing better, occupancy has been going up in general. San Diego's outpaced the national average by a little bit and has always done better than the national average in terms of levels. Um, this is the seasonal curve, and you can sort of, if you find uh, the, the peaks are in July, the one on the right, um, and that's what you sort of see in a typical you know, uh, beach destination market. Um, so when we look at the story for hotels, is occupancy is rising a little faster than national average, ADRs are rising uh, faster than national average, the peak to trial ratio is constant. So when I say like we think about investigating a market, what we're gonna do is present the data. So these are the key things I would look at. Now what I'll tell you is if you look at this data for uh, what you call brick and mortar or store-based retail, you would, and you said, hey, how's Amazon doing versus how store-based store retail is? The American census has uh, great statistics on how brick and mortar stores are doing, and online sales are growing by about 12% a year, and brick and mortar sales are either flat or declining by about 3% a year over the last eight years. And that's why you see places going out of business or moving their sales online. So Walmart, JCPenney, and so forth are doing their sales online. And so it's not the case that this kind of methodology generally won't reveal a fragility in a market or a high degree of competition. When there is high degree of competition, it usually falls out of the grass. Now this is not to say every market will be like this. I'll show you one more. In San Diego, the telltale signs we see, so from an Expedia Inc. perspective, what we're seeing is a consistent story that the demand base looks largely different. The, both markets seem to be growing. The vacation rental market is growing faster, but in a period of rapid growth, the hotel industry has experienced better than average growth, both in ADRs and occupancy. So we feel good approaching San Diego <coughs> with the message of common sense regulations around STRs, 
and you're going to have two thriving industries because you're attracting two different segments of demand. Um, now, the challenge for an OTA like Expedia is you have someone that knows Expedia's brand and goes there to book a hotel room because they have two people or less in their set. And Expedia wants to show vacation rentals and hotels, but they have a demand segment that has a clear preference for hotels. So that's the, the challenge of intermingling, is that these markets, on the one, one, one hand, it's a good news story, I think, for the tourism industry in general. On the one hand, it's, for me, as a head of data science of this company, that's supposed to integrate intermingle sort, it's a challenge story, how to do this in a way that the user experience is, is, is fluid, and a challenge of marketing, because you're trying to hit an Expedia message instead of that simplicity booking and so forth and selection, also family travel groups, big homes and stuff like that, it, it gets quite difficult. Um, and that's one of the things, so it's positive and a challenge, ch challenge as well. Um, I won't go through it, but the sort of rev part and so forth is, is equally strong. When we talk to San Diego, one of the things we try to layer on there is, hey, what is your, what's this source and rental market doing to your housing supply? In general, Housing prices will be driven by, in a big sort of San Diego, employment growth. Unless there is sort of meteoric increase in something like vacation rental. You can see that seasonal homes are less than 2% of total homes, and so even a doubling of seasonal homes is a relatively small increase in the total demand for homes versus employment growth. So San Diego's experienced employment growth, uh, this is essentially the national average. 1.7% puts them at the 45th percentile, a little below the national average. So when you think of affordability crisis type urban areas like Seattle, San Francisco, New York, their employment growth is double this. And so they have as many people arriving that need homes as there are seasonal homes in San Diego every year. And that creates the intense pressure on housing prices. And so when we think of approaching these areas, an area of experience and affordability crisis because of employment growth is a trickier conversation and probably a different regulatory solution because they have an ongoing in, in, uh, affordability problem. San Diego doesn't have such a problem. And so my message, I don't get to talk to the mayor of San Diego, presumably, but I don't think they should let me. But if they did, I would be like, look, you don't have a problem here. You have a growth industry. What you should think about is really common sense things and be as proactive as possible to benefit from both. Okay? Tell your hoteliers life is good and tell them to look at a graph of JCPenney's stock price and retail sales and look at life when it isn't good. And then hopefully if everyone's being sensible, the conversation needs. So San Diego is a pretty easy story. Now, a market like Chicago or New York, the story can be quite different because of the compliance issues and the cost basis of running an apartment complex like a hotel that you don't have a higher cost basis based on unions and so forth. But in San Diego, it doesn't seem to be present. Um, that's San Diego. So it's a hybrid urban market, and you're seeing a, because of demand segmentation, you're seeing a pretty consistent story. And you know what we want to do, what we're trying to build towards at Homeway and VRBO is produce these reports, and once you have a methodology, if there's an area where there's serious, serious competition, we should just go out and say that. If there's an area where there's an affordability crisis, I think we should just come out and say that and work with them. I think it's sort of a little silly to have a very single-minded point of view, um, and can be a little more flexible, and work with municipalities, and just having the playbook of the analysis. I was going to show you this exact same playbook for Orange Beach, Alabama, um, and what my team is doing is it's actually building you know, an internal app so you can create reports like this and start writing them. And I have a couple uh, really crack economists working on this uh, full time. I will say that every piece of analysis, uh, Sherry Fang, you know, you know, Wang did, not, not myself. Um, Gulf Shores and Orange Beach is a fantastic tourism destination in Alabama. And um, right now in Orange Beach, there's 6,000 listings on VRBO and 2,000 listings on Airbnb. If you look at their units of seasonal homes, um, there are 8,500 seasonal condos in Orange Beach and 1,500 hotel rooms. And so you can see that almost all, again, the potential supply is on the professional market. Now there's some overlap in these listings, but you can sort of, even if there's no overlap, there's no overlap in basically all of them, and if it's 100% overlap, it's 75%. Um, you can also see in these traditional vacation destinations, it's often the case, unlike San Diego, that there's more room nights available in the short-term rental market than there are in the hotel market. So that's one of the reasons these cut. In a place like New York, it's like 90, 10 hotels, right? And so if there's a spectrum. A place like Orange Beach is towards almost the other end, Panama City, Florida, the other end where it's 
uh, the, the market is, is more dominated by short term rentals. Um, Orange Beach and Baldwin County um, also depend heavily on tourism. They are, in percentage terms, more dependent on tourism in San Diego um, by about a factor of three. Uh, I, in the interest of time, won't read you a bunch of numbers, but you know, maybe I seem credible enough to just assert with a slight transition. Um, Orange Beach, same methodology, add up Airbnb bookings, add up homeway bookings, do some time series analysis. We expect Orange Beach to grow about 14% next year across both marketplaces. Um, again, you're seeing that very strong seasonal pattern in book nights, um, also a beach destination, so also in July. And projecting out, we're looking, Orange Beach is looking at um, a good news story in 2019 or 2020 of being a 30% larger market. Now, based on the fixed supply, they can grow this just based on increased efficiencies of booking um, up about 2019. Then we're talking a complete red line of the supply. And so that, that's why we projected it out that far. Um, Orange Beach uh, hotel occupancy, if you look every column is 2015, 2016, 2017, the first panel is occupancy. You can see that a, a seasonal pattern emerges, but in the summer, it's between 75 and 80%, pretty consistent. In the fall, between 57 and 62%, grew in the fall, grew in the winter, a little lower in the summer. You plot this on graphs and see basically flat lines. So unlike San Diego, where hotels were experiencing occupancy growth, in Orange Beach, hotels were experiencing very small or not significant occupancy growth. Um, they are experiencing increases in ADRs if you look across from left, left to right um, in ADRs. And so um, in every period but the peak, um, and in peak they're experiencing flat. Um, so hotels in Orange Beach are in a period of, while well, the VR industry is in a period of 14% growth in ADR growth, hotel or is in a period of slight to zero growth and slight to zero ADR. Right? So this is a little different story in that while hotels are holding strong in the face of massive growth, and 14% is an enormous number in my opinion, they are holding strong, they're not experiencing J.C. Penny like withering, they're also not growing like they were in San Diego. This is what you often see in these vacation destinations because they were the smaller, they were sort of the smaller component of the industry and the, the town is very centered around this condo beachfront uh, uh, sales notion. Um, Looking at this over time, this is the ADR, and I mentioned you're seeing, experiencing a flat trend. One of the things you do see, and I think this is probably real, is a little decline in that peak to trough ratio. And we saw that in the last chart. So where the hotel industry in Orange Beach is affected the most, and although it's moderate, is in a little peak, peak load pricing power weakening in July. And that's what's happening. And when we look at the seasonal pattern for STRs, that's when STRs are doing the best. Right? And so SDRs are growing, and some of that growth in the peak period is affecting pricing power. Um, order here of uh, um, a decrease in this, in this sort of gap, which is huge, but starting about $100 of about 5%. Um, and so we see here in San Diego a very consistent story. At Orange Beach, I would say hotels are holding strong, but not thriving. Um, and they're, the question is, for Orange Beach, what to do. And so here I'd say, again, I didn't like to show the visitor segmentation, it is a very similar story of visitor segmentation. And so the reason we're so concerned about Orange Beach is um, Orange Beach is considering regulations that will, to show you, that will dramatically change the industry. And that is where we get, oh, did I, did I that graph? Um, uh, oh, well, that sucks for me. Fine, I'll tell you too. Uh, Orange Beach is considering regulations that will ban SDRs where 40% of the demand base comes from right now. And so if this regulation passes, 40% of the condos, well, 50% of the condos that are on the short-term rental market, 40% of the book nights will be illegal. Okay? Um, Orange Beach economy is 24% tourism, of that about 18% of its short-term rental market. So they're actually considering a policy that will reduce their economic output by about 10%. It's quite rare, typically, for a, a community to consider such a policy. Um, and the, uh, from a regulatory perspective, what I think this analysis shows them is that the thriving STR industry should not be shut down because it is killing hotel lodging taxes. It should not be shut down because hoteliers are suffering under the burden of an Amazon.com explosion. And it should not be shut down for, I think, fear of police reports like that. What it should be is a, a conversation to have the license in place and to collect a the lodging tax that does, if there is an offset in hotel demand, does 
make sure the city coffers do benefit as you experience this explosive growth, not just through the merchants in the city and sales tax, but through direct lodging taxes that can be put towards policies that uh, strengthen up the residential community. So um, the method of analysis here, like I said, is what our goal at Only VRBO is to start producing these reports for every vacation destination in the country, every urban area. And what I would guess is that there'll be some areas where the, the two segments of uh, accommodation supply compete, I would say, I would expect in the, in the greatest sense, they compete pretty in a moderate way, and in the San Diego sense, they seem to be completely bifurcated. And the a municipality should understand that, look at their hotels they're, they're building, look at their supply coming online, not want to strand that supply, and then work with how they think about total occupancy tax to make sure that their tax vehicles are adjusting to the changing, changing nature of accommodation supply. Now, tourism in general is growing in the United States. A few reasons for that, we're still in the midst of an economic recovery, but we're gonna experience the next 10 years a secular shift, I think, away from hours worked. In the next 20 or 30 years, almost certainly, and leisure, non-consumer durable leisure experience expenditure is rising. Partly that's because technology has made everything cheaper, right? A Honda Civic costs the same amount of money in nominal terms today than it did when I was a kid, which is staggering to me. Because this new Civic gets 10 miles per gallon more at side impact airbags and all this stuff, and it costs $17,000, which the damn Civic cost when I was a kid. And so just by the fact that technological progress is so strong in manufacturing, you have wallet dollars being available for tourism. And so what's happening right now is that those, the expansion of the tourism industry is happening in both hotels, and the overall, we saw that overall hotel occupancy, um, is happening in both hotels and vacation rentals. And although vacation rentals are growing more rapidly, the rapid growth of vacation rentals does not seem to have thrown the hotel growth off trend, which looks like it's appealing to different market segments. Now the question going forward is how both can benefit. And Expedia Inc's right now is playing a branding strategy of we have all the accommodation you need, and VRBO is probably the place you go for vacation rentals. What will be interesting to see with booking strategy in Europe, and I sort of talked about this a little bit, is there what you consider a vacation rental I think is very blurry. And that is a different conversation I think around local employment law and unions that I'm not an expert in, and I don't really fully understand the complexities of, but that is one where again, the regulation will proceed on closing loopholes to make sure that the law in place is applied as such. Okay. So Austin right now uh, is considering, I think the, they're balancing the rancor of their constituents for someone putting up a short-term rental right next to them with the benefit of increased tourism because they'll look at stats like we're showing and what all the stats seem to indicate is you're gonna have a material increase in net visitors because vacation rentals or apartments appeal to a different demand segment and therefore your overall tourism industry will increase. So that's the benefit you have on the table. The cost you have is uh, impact to residential home prices. I think if it's not an affordability crisis, we're pretty small. The costs are you didn't zone proactively and so you have someone with a five person family and they don't, there is a actual inefficiency to have that next door, and everyone would agree with that. Like, I think it would be crazy not to agree with that. I don't want a dentist next to my house, and I don't want a nightclub, right? You just, and there's a reason there's zoning laws. And like I said, it's sort of very hard to find vitriolic comments back and forth on Quora or Reddit about the existence of zoning laws. I challenge you to have a contentious conversation about this with anyone. But I think if we start from the perspective that zoning laws economically make sense, the question is how do you apply these? What's the playbook to apply them in urban areas so that they don't improperly, they don't sort of disrupt potentially a good thing, but they also don't sort of take away what was a reasonable expectation of residence. Um, for hotels, they'll probably be interested in where those zones are laid out, and there might be, in terms of thinking about how these markets are bifurcated and thinking about how they're feeling, there might be a sort of policy position there as well. That'll be, I think, very interesting to consider. But I think that's where we really should move the conversation to, and when you look at the data, I think it's a lot less of a scary story for both hotels and residential communities because of where the demand is. I wish I had a few graphs, but the demand in San Diego, for instance, is really concentrated in a few areas, right? And so you don't have to allow these things everywhere. And that's what Carlsbad did, right? And there's not really a crisis there. And we're not we're arguing to expand it out into 10 miles inland um, in Carlsbad, nor are people on the coast arguing that we should take it away because the property values are buoyed by the fact that there's an economic industry going on. So that's. That's how we approach it. Like, hopefully, we start producing these reports. I have five minutes left. I can take questions, or I don't think I have any more to say. I think you sort of heard me babble on and on. I can't tell. I can't see your faces, so I can't tell how bored you are. So that's one of the things. They have like, these lights in your face, and you really can't tell. 
Um, it's like giving a talk in a sound studio. Um, okay, so uh, y'all seen enough graphs, right? Economics, tables, let's make sure. Oh, I will show you this, because this is scary. This is one of those, like, you can't make it up type graphs. The last, Orange Beach right now is a moratorium on SDR permits, and they're considering banning in 40% of the areas. This is the median home sales price in Baldwin County. Couldn't get it Orange Beach. Um, you can see it's, I don't think this is home selling for less money. It's the nice homes are just frozen market, right? This is a liquidity crisis in home sales. Um, looking at the addresses where these told me dug a little deeper, makes a lot of sense. The, the value of these homes is buoyed by the ability to put them on the short-term rental market, so the ones that are in valuable places are simply not selling due to the uncertainty and the risk. Um, and so this is, again, you can see the markets really do react to these kind of legislative proposals. Um, okay, I'll actually close this graph, and that's it. I don't, I don't know, actually, I don't, I don't, I don't, wait, here's questions. What do I got here? Is short-term rental supply in the U.S. still growing? Uh, there's six million homes in the U.S. approximately classified as seasonal homes, and our best guess is less than a third of those are on are in the short-term rental market. Um, and less than that are on major marketplace platforms like VRBO, Airbnb. And so the short-term rental supply in terms of the availability in a professional market setting is growing. I don't think there's evidence that seasonal homes or homes that are not classified as long-term owner-occupied or long-term renter, long renter-occupied is growing. The data source there you want to go to is the census, is the ground truth, but the American Community Survey is a version, a statistical version of the census done for large areas every year or three years or every five years, depending on how big the area is. These data are freely available online and all the supply numbers I show you are from there. So that's one that's kind of easy to answer and should be non-controversial. Any given area, you can uh, have a data analyst your company pull the American Community Survey. There's an integration into R or Python. You can have it in your console in, in two minutes. And so I would say no, but increase in professional activity. Um, how are you keeping abreast all the regulatory changes and how successfully do you steer the conversation in the right direction of authorities? We have a government relations team, and Airbnb is a big one. I would say, honestly, that the my hope would be we could go from a more reactive point of view. So Orange Beach, obviously you can hear the urgency in my town. If they take away 50% of the market, they will have an economic recession there. And we want to come there and we have this sort of doom and gloom, don't do this story. That's a little bit annoying to always deliver. I'd much rather go to a place like this, it's actually doing pretty sensible things right now, and say, hey, let's shore everything up, talk to the community while things are in a good state, and get a good news message here, not just that we put out a fire type message. So I think that that is where the conversation has to shift. I, would, I think if you looked at how Uber and Lyft have dealt with municipalities, they're in that transition period too. And I think that's where we need to get to. I think if we're always reactive, it will never really get to a place of good policy. Because I don't think those sort of reactive conversations with good policy happens. Um, OTAs, so booking had an interesting, but so you integrate, so you have different brands. Booking had villas.com, they tried to have a different brand, they shut that down, and now they've integrated. So booking A-B tests everything. So I would infer that their data would say they're better off selling, a, they're better off converting a visitor with an integrated experience. Um, Expedia integrates and has a separate brand. And so I think what we'll, both companies will do is we'll continue to A-B test, we'll continue to explore, but what we really care about from an OTA perspective is, hey, when a visitor arrives at our site, a qualified visitor, how often do we convert them into a, a accommodation experience? That at that experience especially, they have a good NPS score, they have a good experience. And so I think this will be a very data-driven exercise, but probably different by market, and probably different by market segment. You know, I don't think, um, I think for business travel, it might be a different experience than consumer, and for consumer, it, you, you might have a branded strategy where Expedia Inc., a hotels.com website, focus on the SLAS, Expedia, brand Expedia, or VRBO, um, has a different strategy. Um, do you think that the shift in types of travel to the market and millennials or baby members, for example, is going to continue to drive the growth of STR? Um, I think I would, it, maybe. Um, I think mostly what we see is a less of a correlation between age and more of a correlation between party size and event types. So I think STRs thrive when big events are happening. I think STRs drive for adult groups and families, and I think I would hope it's across ages. So I don't think that's a kind of fear story for hotels. 
Um, but in terms of how hotel supply changes, and we are seeing this, into supply units that can accommodate those bigger groups, that's what I would expect to see, and that's how I think they'd sort of compete that. And now I'm getting double zeros, and the questions are gone, so I can't ask them. Done. Next, here we go. <laughs>